world. My next guest is a creative, ambitious, energetic, results-driven marketeer. She's renowned for always pushing to try new things and daring to be different in order to engage with new customers meaningfully. Please join me in welcoming Michelle Irwin, EVP of Marketing of Sky to the show. Michelle, are you ready to get radically transparent with me? I am. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. We're so excited to have you on the show. Uh, and you know, I'm just thinking out loud to myself. I know there's been so much going on. You know, we're nearing, you know, we're H2, which is insane to even think about. What keeps you up these days at night professionally? Pretty much everything. I feel like I am an insomniac. Um, there's a couple of things though, really recently. So I've actually just taken on all of our product marketing and enablement within Sky. So getting my head around that, making sure that I don't mess things up um, is a kind of a big worry right now. Um, and I guess the other part kind of more broadly is just um, working on our go-to-market strategy. So as we're entering Q4, we're kind of deep into the planning for 2025. And we really want to take a step back. Like one of the things that we've noticed at Sky is we're all working in our swim lanes. So we've got marketing, product marketing, enablement, um, the demand gen team, our SDR team, our sales team, like everybody's working hard, but it's very siloed. And as we go into 2025, we really want to improve the focus across those teams. Um, and I've been asked to kind of, or been challenged with kind of being that linchpin that brings our go-to-market strategy together. So that's on my mind a lot right now. It's, uh, I wouldn't say sleepless, but it's definitely on my mind as I go to sleep. <laughs> Absolutely. Listen, I think when it comes to marketing, we all know that marketing cannot operate in a silo, let alone any other department, but it's so easy to fall into the day-to-day, -day, the tactical, however you may want to call it, that it's so easy to fall into that. So as you take the reins into bringing everybody under that one revenue team, I can imagine you're not sleeping um, at night and maybe having at least a cup of tea in the evening to kind of, to get your, your thoughts together. You know, as a, as a marketing leader, you know, we, we do talk a lot about bringing everybody under the rep one team, right? One revenue team. We are all one, you know, we're all one team. We had, um, you know, a guest last week talking about, you know, how marketing is a team sport. How are you bringing everyone under one roof at Sky to create that unified revenue team? Because it is not easy. It isn't easy. Um, and especially when, like you say, you've got a lot of people who are used to working in a certain kind of way and, it's hard to change behaviors and it's hard when I'm in the UK and the rest of my team are all in the US. Um, like it's really difficult to try and get everybody to work together, especially like when you're hybrid as well nowadays, like it's tough, it's a challenge and it's not something you can do overnight. So we've been kind of sowing this seed of one team for probably about 12 months now. Um, it started at our sales kickoff or our revenue kickoff. We changed the name this year to try and get everybody to think as kind of one revenue arc. Um, and it started there where it was kind of one was the theme of revenue kickoff. And ever since then, it's kind of gone back into a few swim lanes again this year. Like everybody's executing on their plans. And yes, there's collaboration. And yes, we talk, but we're still very, very siloed. So what we've now done is... Um, bring in one person to kind of lead go-to-market strategy. Um, that person being me right now. Um, and the, it's not that I'm doing it all. Like there's no way a marketing leader can actually drive your entire company's go-to-market strategy. It's so reliant on um, having a seat at the kind of management table, being able to bring in stakeholders from products, from um, the revenue org, from all of the different departments that are, um, part of this go-to-market and but but we needed somebody who would drive this like we needed somebody who could bring everything together and see the bigger picture and have that connection with every team to actually start making those connections and pull it all together into a plan and start to kind of guide the strategy so I think there's a couple of things throughout this year like I've I've got an ally <laughs> like there's somebody who really believes in the direction that we need to go and the um, the way that we need to kind of make an impact. So that's been really important is to have somebody kind of by your side that can help you push this vision um, when other people can't see it. 
Um, and now we're kind of at the point where we're starting to just go through the process piece by piece. Like we can't, you can't build an entire go-to-market strategy overnight and you can't change behaviors overnight. So we're taking it like bit by bit. And we're starting with really kind of going back to what do we want to achieve as a business? What are our objectives? Defining our ICP, like really getting deep into the data, understanding who our best customers are, and then building our kind of go-to-market around that in terms of the messaging, the content, the value props, the demand gen plan, aligning sales and how they're actually structured and territory alignment and all that kind of stuff, the measurements, what will everything is kind of being built around that. So it's slow. It's slower than I would like because I'm a very impatient person, but it's we've got to be patient and we've got to start kind of making the changes bit by bit, making sure everybody's bought in kind of taking it forward from that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I think that, you know, I know the term a few years back was, you know, digital transformation. And as you were speaking, right, as you try to create these new processes, these new collaboration, whether it's meetings or sinks or, you know, high level meetings with the right stakeholders in those rooms, you can't change a behavior, right? So it does take time. Uh, you know, so it does sound though, you're on a pretty good track. Uh, and that everyone is, you know, moving towards that working, working as one. When it comes to building your go-to-market strategy, how are you balancing what I'll call the basics, like you know, your ABM approach, your inbound, your outbound marketing, with more of the innovative approaches? I know that you love to take risks and try new things, and you know, kind of where's that balance between the basics and the risks? So. It's interesting because there's a lot of kind of theory out there that you should be putting all of your money into ABM nowadays. And it's like using the data and using science, like people buy from people and people like we're still human at the end of the day, even when we're selling B2B. So I do personally have strong beliefs that brand still plays a massive role, if not more than ever, because you're up against so much competition. And we have to stand out from the crowd. Like we have to take risks. So I think that part of kind of how I'm thinking about next year is we know our ICP, like that immediately, like we've not been very good at defining that in the past. And we've done a lot of work to really kind of get into that. And who who are we really going to get to buy from us? And how can we focus our attention on that? Just going through that exercise has meant that we can kind of reduce a lot of the noise that we had in marketing. Like our budgets were being spread quite thin because we were going after so many different personas and so many with so many different solutions. Like by just doing that exercise, it's kind of given me pockets of money that I can get back and put into other kind of more creative things. We're starting to think about the split between demand creation and demand capture. Um, we've we use a last touch attribution model. So obviously Google AdWords, it terrifies everyone when I say we're going to pull budget from that because they're like, but that's what works. That's what's create. I'm like, no, that's what works when we're looking at last touch attribution. Like there's a lot of work that goes into it beforehand before somebody's even coming to you. So we're really looking at that split um, between how much budget goes to the capture versus creation. And we want to turn it on its head. Like we want to put more into the brand building and we're about to switch off in Q4 our Google AdWords and see, like, let's try it. Let's see, <laughs> not all together, not quite all together, but like reduce it down to a third of what it is today. And we have a significant Google AdWords budget. So um, we're going to reduce it down and we're going to start experimenting with other kind of more brand building channels um, do more kind of human stuff. And then same with events and things next year, um, we're probably going to shift more to, again, the kind of slightly different on that one in that we don't want to necessarily be at all the big trade shows where we can't control the audience. We can't control the messaging. Like, yes, they're fine from a branding point of view, but really what impact do they have? Um, so actually there, we want to try and do more of our own events. So when I first started at Sky, we used to do like festival events and we did a dinner in the sky. We did dinner at the top of the Eiffel Tower. Like everyone still talks about these years on. And I'm like, we need to get back to this. Like we need to bring more creativity back in and not just get lost in another trade show. So 
we're trying to get the balance right. Um, and that's just in marketing. Then there's obviously kind of what the sales team are doing, what the SDR team are doing. It all We need to get it all working together. Absolutely. Listen, I, I wish you the, knowing what's coming in Q4, I, I wish you the best of, of success with the the new campaigns and the, the AdWords. And, and I can't wait to see you guys rock it. Um, you mentioned something that I thought was interesting. So you, under that umbrella of revenue, you have sales, you have product marketing, you have marketing, you have sales enablement. And it's interesting to me because, right, when you have to move the organization as one, right, and you look at kind of that, you know, product, product marketing, marketing, sales enablement, kind of its own flow or funnel, however you'd like to refer to it, where do you think the handover between marketing, so like we can couple product marketing, marketing together and sales typically needs the most attention. And then we can, you know, kind of throw in there, right? How do you ensure a true, a, a smooth transition that benefits both teams? I I don't think there is a handover. Like I think in the past, there probably was like marketing was doing the promotions, bringing in the opportunity, and then it was over to sales to kind of take that on. I think in this whole kind of ABX world, we have to stop thinking that way. Like we are not measuring leads anymore. We're measuring everything by accounts and that account goes on its own kind of life cycle. So one of the things that we've been doing recently is just mapping out, out that end-to-end -end account life cycle from like the demand creation, the demand capture through to then the opportunity coming in and it then becoming a sales opportunity to it becoming a customer and how we then grow the account through advocacy. And at each stage, what we've done is start to look at, okay, what are the roles and responsibilities of the marketing team, the sales team, the SDR team, the growth team, the CS team, and who's responsible, who's accountable, like going through the whole kind of racy for each of that. And again, just, yes, we all kind of think this, but having it documented changes everybody's mindset and they really just understand like the role that they play. So there isn't a single stage in there where marketing isn't involved. Um, it might be like one of the bits of data that we've seen is um, after we've handed an opportunity over to sales and they've booked the demo, we were getting a lot of drop-offs. Like a lot of our demos don't even happen. Um, so we wanted to dig into that. We wanted to understand why and then bring them back into a nurture flow and see what we could do to actually improve that attendance to demo rates. So that point at which normally you would hand it over and be like, bye, like over to you guys. Why aren't you closing it? We put the blame on it. Actually, there's a lot of work happening around like the collaboration between us now to make sure that um, it, it's just this constant loop and there's constant feedback and we're getting insights at every stage and we're helping and so on and so forth. So I, I think the handover needs to kind of stop and we just all need to think about again, like collaboratively, collaboratively, how we work as one revenue org across that whole kind of life cycle. I think that's a really powerful food for thought, if you will, as we enter into 2025, right? Um, I agree that the handover, it's an interesting space and we need to kind of catch up with the times. So knowing, right, I'm taking a pause, processing, knowing that we're kind of shifting, I guess, over into this, we are one, you know, let's ditch the handover and continue to collaboratively work together. Let's talk metrics, right? Because <laughs> like, right, if that wasn't complicated enough, let's throw in the metrics, right? Because then, you know, you, you, I, I, right, like well, this was like the traditional war between sales and marketing, right? We're all, we're, we're measured on the same thing in terms of the end result, but at the same time, how we get there, we're measured differently. So how are you reevaluating your measurements to ensure that sales, marketing, product teams, everybody's all contributing to business success, but like also at the end of the day, you know, being held accountable for what they need to actually bring to the table? This bit we haven't cracked yet. So <laughs> we are still very old school. We, at the start of the year, marketing have to drive a third of pipeline, sales have to drive a third of pipeline, SDRs have to drive a third of pipeline. And it terrifies our leadership to move away from that. I think it's partly we're an Israeli company like you and like <laughs> we have to hold people accountable. And this is the only <laughs> way we can see what everybody's doing is to have each department like to actually move away from this last touch attribution and look at the impact of every single touch point along a journey and understand that 
the SDR might not have brought the opportunity in, but they had a really big role to play and that's okay. Like it, <laughs> it's scary for some people. Like they really don't want to move away from this model. So what I, where I want to get to, and again, it's part of this, like, I know I need to get there, but there's a lot of other things we need to kind of bring everybody on the journey to before we hit the measurement piece is I want one, one revenue goal, which we have today, but then one pipeline goal. So it doesn't matter who it is, sales, marketing, whoever, like we're one team and we should all be working towards that overall goal. And then we can start to look at, okay, which channel is it going to come from? Let's not look at like team. It doesn't matter. Um, is it going to be inbound? Um, is it going to be from ABX? Is it going to be from like an intro from a salesperson? Is it going to be an SDR outreach? Like we'll start to look at it by channel and then look historically at like what each channel has generated so that we can start to see, okay, well, we know we need to invest X into this part. We need to do this here. Like we can start to look at it that way rather than being like a third, a third, a third. Um, and then I think as well, looking along that kind of account life cycle from the, the buyer journey through to the sales opportunity through to like customer life cycle, having core KPIs that we all align around. So, and whoever the person who is responsible at that point is. So for example, like marketing and demand creation, we've got a lot of brand metrics that we need to be measuring. Like we've created a brand scorecard and we want to be looking at all of the different areas that are going to impact creation. Um, and then capture, like we're looking at the sales qualified leads, like the ACV of pipeline. So we're going to start mapping all of these metrics and hopefully get to a point where our pipeline calls each week are not, well, what's marketing doing this week? And it's kind of a readout and you're justifying your function to actually looking at, okay, great. We're 3X coverage. We need, like, there's a gap here. Like there's red here in this channel. There's a problem. Like, what can we do to address it? So that's where I want to get to. We're absolutely nowhere near that right now. There's a long way to go. Um, but definitely I, I see the path for how we're going to get there. It's just picking my moments to like start these conversations. Absolutely. So I can definitely see why you're not sleeping at night. Um, so <laughs> given, given kind of the evolution of how we're thinking about metrics and where we want to take the organization, um, have you adopted any strategies or you know, anything that may help us understand how we can drive future success? Like even, you know, tried anything, dabbled with anything? I think the biggest mindset shift I've had to make this year, going from kind of somebody who headed up the Marcoms team to somebody who's now leading the entire team, like the entire marketing team and the go-to-market strategy is data is your best friend and <laughs> rev ops and the marketing ops team i'm literally on calls with every single day um th there's so much you can learn from the insights that we have available if you want to start digging into it and quite often it just paints like it makes it so obvious what you need to do and you can go off gut instinct and you can still kind of use that in some facets of marketing. But that for me has been like the biggest change I've made this year is just becoming a lot more kind of data driven. I think I read years ago, like marketers are going to become like the next chief data officers. And I genuinely feel like most of the time I'm just talking data and like on a call this morning with our chief data officer and we were getting deep into stuff. So it's. <laughs> it's just become this whole kind of new experience but that for me is kind of what I'm taking like forward and um using to kind of drive future success I love that deep into the data and I also love the evolution of marketing right back in the day we were the creatives you know we had the ideas and now it's really looking at the data so yes maybe maybe my next role is going to be chief data officer we shall see um <laughs> i miss the i'm i mean i you said it at the beginning i um i love the creative side so it kills me sometimes getting into the data i it pains me i'm like why don't we just go and do something really fun and big and make everyone like 
engage with us like that's what you really need and yeah no, you <laughs> got to balance it absolutely and data we trust always um so last question for you michelle what's one thing that you can share about yourself that we actually cannot learn about you from simply looking at your linkedin profile um so you probably if you look at my linkedin profile you probably think that my um my love for marketing, I guess, began when I did my placement at IBM um, as part of my university course, but it actually started maybe 10 years before that. So I am a massive Southport Football Club fan. My mum and dad met watching Southport Football Club, so it's been in like my blood since I was a baby. <laughs> Um, and one summer they'd had enough of me and they sent me off. I think I was like 11 years old and they sent me off to Southport with the chief commercial officer. And I like followed him around and went to all these meetings and he was securing sponsorships for the upcoming season. And I was like, marketing is so cool. Like, this is what I want to do forever. Like I want to be in marketing and it kind of stuck from there. Like I, after that, I went from wanting to be like a physiotherapist, that was going to be my life, to I'm going to be in marketing. Like I want to be, and I want to do marketing at Southport Football Club, which clearly doesn't pay very well. So I've ended up in technology. <laughs> but that's, uh, that's probably one thing you don't know about me is my love. I'm there. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I love that it started at such a young age and and the glow, you know, I, th- I you know, there's this running joke, right? Like, you know, for sales, they didn't necessarily want to be sales, but everybody fell into sales. And I feel for marketing, you know, usually you're going after B2C brands and, you know, I don't know if you're watching Emily in Paris right now, but right. There's kind of this stigma. Right. And, and so I think that's a great, the football club. It's a great, I love that story. It's fantastic. Thank you for sharing it with us. I will end up there. That will be my last job. When I retire, I'm going to go back and I'll be like, hey, like, can I just do this for volunteering? So for everyone listening, please go ahead now and follow Michelle Irwin on LinkedIn so that you can see once she's retired at the football club. Um, But in the meantime, right, she posts a lot of interesting content. She's a great person to be connected with. Michelle, if anybody has any questions about Sky or if anybody has any questions about, you know, taking over that one revenue team and driving it forward where is the best place to reach you message me on linkedin i uh, i check that regularly and i'm always happy to engage with anyone and i think it's so important for us as marketers to share and learn um so always open to having conversations coffees amazing michelle thank you for getting radically transparent with me with me today and i look forward to seeing all your posts in the feed um I, we had a blast thanks jen